Chapter Eight of My Doggy and I by Robert Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Allison Hester. Chapter Eight: Little Slider resists temptation successfully, and I become enslaved. Pompey said i one afternoon while reclining on the sofa in dobson's drawing-room my leg being not yet sufficiently restored to admit of my going out pompey i've got news for you to my surprise my doggie would not answer to that name at all when i used it though he did so when it was used by miss blythe dumps said i in a somewhat injured tone ears and tail at once replied come now punch i said rather sternly i'll call you what i please punch dumps or pompey because you are my dog still at least as long as your mistress and i live under the same roof so sir if you take the dumps when i call you pompey i'll punch your head for you evidently the dog thought this was a very flat jest for he paid no attention to it whatsoever now dumps come here and let's be friends who do you think is coming to stay with us to stay all together you'll never guess your old friend and first master little slider no less think of that dumps wagged his tail vigorously whether at the news or because of pleasure at my brushing the hair off his soft brown eyes and looking into them i cannot tell yes i continued it's quite true this fire will apparently be the making of little slider as well as for you and me for we are all going to live and work together isn't that nice evidently dr mctougall is a trump and so is his friend dobson who puts this fine mansion at his disposal until another home can be got ready for us i was interrupted at this point by an uproarious burst of laughter from the doctor himself who had entered by the open door unobserved by me i joined in the laugh against myself but blushed nevertheless for a man does not like as a rule to be caught talking earnestly either to himself or to a dumb creature why melon he said sitting down beside me and patting my dog i imagined from your tones as i entered that you were having some serious conversation with my wife no mrs mctougall has not yet returned from her drive i was merely having a chat with dumps i had of late in my lodgings got into a way of thinking aloud as it were while talking to my dog i suppose it was with an unconscious desire to break the silence of my room no doubt no doubt replied the doctor with a touch of sympathy in his tone you must have been rather lonely in that attic of yours and yet do you know i sometimes sigh for the quiet of such an attic perhaps when you've been some months under the same roof with these miniature thunderstorms jack harry job jenny and dolly you'll long to go back to the attic a tremendous thump on the floor overhead followed by a wild uproar sent the doctor upstairs three steps at a stride i sat prudently still till he returned which he did in a few minutes laughing what do you think that was he cried panting only my dolly tumbling off the chest of drawers my babes have many pleasant little games among others cutting off the heads of dreadful traitors is a great favorite they roll up a sheet into a ball for the head then each of them is led in turn to the scaffold which is the top of a chest of drawers one holds the ball against the criminal's shoulders another cuts it off with a wooden knife a basket receives it below then one of them takes it out and holding it aloft shouts behold the head of a traitor it seems that four criminals have been safely decapitated and dolly was being led to the fatal block when she slipped her foot and fell to the ground overturning harry and a chair in her descent that was all not hurt i hope oh no they never get hurt seriously hurt i mean as to black and blue shins scratches cuts and bumps they may be said to exist in a perpetually maimed condition strange said i musingly that they should like to play at such a disagreeable subject disagreeable exclaimed my friend pooh that's nothing you should see them playing at the horrors of the inquisition my poor wife sometimes shudders at the idea that we have been gifted with five monsters of cruelty 
but any one can see with half an eye that it is a fine sense of the propriety of retributive justice that influences them anyone who chooses to go and look at the five innocent faces when they are asleep said i laughing can see with a quarter of an eye that you and mrs mctougall are to be congratulated on the nature of your little ones of course we are my dear fellow returned the doctor with enthusiasm but to change the subject has little slider been here to-day not that i know of ah oh, there he is said the doctor as at that instant the doorbell rang there is insolence in the very tone of his ring he has pulled the visitor's bell too and there goes the knocker of all the imps that walk a london street boy is the sentence was cut short by the opening of the door and the entrance of my little protege he had evidently got himself up for the occasion for his shoe black uniform had been well brushed his hands and face severely washed, and his hair plastered well down with soap and water. "'Come in, Slider. That's your name, isn't it?' said the doctor. "'It is, sir. Rob and Slider at your service,' replied the urchin, giving me a familiar nod. "'Ope your leg ain't so cranky as it was, sir. Getting all square, eh?' I repressed a smile with difficulty as I replied, it is much better thank you attend to what dr mctougall has to say to you all serene he replied looking with cool urbanity in the doctor's face fire away you're a shoe black i see said the doctor that's my profession do you like it well when it's dirty weather with lots of mud and coppers going i does when it's all sunshine and starvation i doesn't my friend mr mellon tells me you're a very good boy little slider looked at me with a solemn reproachful air oh what a whopper he said we both laughed at this come slider said i you must learn to treat us with more respect else i shall have to change my opinion of you very good sir that's your business not mine i was invited here and here i am now what have you got to say to me that's the point can you read and write resumed the doctor certainly not replied the boy with an air of one who had been insulted what do you take me for do you think i'm a genius as can read and write without having been taught or do you think i'm a monster who was born reading and writing i've had no school to go to nor nobody to put me there i thought the school board looked after you so they does sir but i've been too many for the school boarders then it's your own fault you've not been taught said the doctor somewhat severely not at all returned the urchin with quiet assurance it's the duty of the school boarders to catch me and they can't catch me that's not my fault it's superiority my friend looked at the little creature before him with much surprise after a few seconds contemplation and thought he continued well slider as my friend here says you are a good sort of boy i am bound to believe him though appearances are somewhat against you now i am in want of a smart boy at present to attend the hall door show patients into my consulting room run messages in short make himself generally useful about the house how would such a situation suit you why doctor said the boy ignoring the question how could any boy attend on your all door when it's burnt to ashes we will manage to have another door replied dr mctougall with a forbearing smile meanwhile you could practice on the door of this house but that is not answering my question boy how would you like the place You'd have light work, a good salary, pleasant society below stairs, and a blue uniform. In short, I'd make a page in buttons of you. What about the vittles? demanded this remarkable boy. Of course, you'd fare as well as the other servants, returned the doctor, rather testily, for his opinion of my little friend was rapidly falling. I could see that, to my regret. Now, give me an answer at once, he continued sharply. Would you like to come? Not by no manner of means, replied Slider promptly. 
We both looked at him in amazement. "'Why, Slider, you stupid fella,' said I, "'what possesses you to refuse so good an offer?' "'Dr. Mellon,' he replied, turning on me with a flush of unwanted earnestness, "'do you think I'd be so shabby, so low, so mean, "'as to go and forsake Granny Willis "'for all the light work and good salaries "'and pleasant society and blue uniforms with buttons in London? "'Who'd make her gruel? "'Who'd polish her shoes every morning "'till you could see the shave in em, "'though she don't never put em on? "'Who'd make her bed and light her fires "'and fetch her odd bits of coal? "'And who'd read the news to her and... "'Why, Slider?' interrupted dr mctougall you said just now that you could not read no more i can sir but i takes in an old newspaper to her every morning and sets myself down by the fire with it before me and pretends to read i invents the news as i go along and you should see that old lady's face and the way her eyes open when i'm a-tapin off the murders and the highway robberies and the burglaries and the fires at home and the wars and earthquakes and other scrimmages abroad it do cheer up most wonderful of course i stick in any hard bits of real news i happens to get hold of but i ain't particular apparently not said the doctor laughing well i see it's of no use tempting you to forsake your present position indeed i would not wish you to leave it some day i may find means to have old mrs willis taken better care of and then well we shall see meanwhile i respect your feelings good-bye and give my regards to granny say i'll be over to see her soon stay said i as the boy turned to leave you never told me that one of your names was robin cause it wasn't when i saw you last i only got it a few days ago indeed from whom from granny willis she gave me the name and i likes it and mean to stick by it good afternoon gentlemen ta-ta punch at the word my doggie bounced from under my hand and began to leap joyfully round the boy i say said robin pausing at the door and looking back she's all right i hope getting better who do you mean why the governess in course my young lady oh yes i'm happy to say she is better said the doctor much amused by the anxious look of the face which had hitherto been the quintessence of cool self-possession but she has had a great shake and will have to be sent to the country for change of air when we can venture to move her i confess that i was much surprised but not a little gratified by the very decided manner in which slider avowed his determination to stand fast by the poor old woman in whom i had been led to take so strong an interest hitherto i had felt some uncertainty as to how far i could depend on the boy's affection for mrs willis and his steadiness of purpose now i felt quite sure of him dr mctougall felt as i did in the matter and so did his friend the city man i had half expected that dobson would have laughed at us for what he sometimes styled our softness because he had so much to do with sharpers and sharp practice but i was mistaken he quite agreed with us in our opinion of my little waif and spoke admiringly of those who sought through evil and good report to rescue our city arabs from destruction and dobson did more than speak he gave liberally out of his ample fortune to the good cause that evening just after the gas was lighted while i was lying on the sofa thinking of these things and toying with dump's ears the door opened and mrs mctougall entered with miss blythe leaning on her arm it was the first time she had come down to the drawing-room since her illness she was thin and pale but to my mind more beautiful than ever for her brown eyes seemed to grow larger and more lustrous as they beamed upon me i leaped up sending an agonizing shoot of pain through my leg and hastened to meet her dumps as if jealous of me sprang wildly on before and danced round his mistress in a whirlwind of delight i'm so glad to see you miss blythe i stammered i had feared the consequences of that terrible night that rude descent you you are better i thank you very much better she replied with a sweet smile 
and how shall I ever express my debt of gratitude to you, Mr. Mellon? She extended her delicate hand. I grasped it, and she shook mine heartily. That shake fixed my fate. No doubt it was the simple and natural expression of a grateful heart for a really important service, but I cared nothing about that. She blushed as I looked at her, and stooped to pat the jealous and impatient dumps. "'Sit here, darling, on this easy chair,' said Mrs. McTougall. "'You know the doctor allows you only a half an hour, or an hour at most, tonight. "'You may be up longer tomorrow. "'There, and you are not to speak much, remember? "'Mr. Mellon, you must address yourself to me. "'Lily is only allowed to listen.' "'Yes, as you truly said, Mr. Mellon,' continued the good lady, who was somewhat garrulous. "'Her descent was rough, and indeed so was mine.' oh i shall never forget that rough monster into whose arms you thrust me that awful night but he was a brave and strong monster too he just gathered me up like a bundle of clothes and went crashing down the blazing stair through fire and smoke and through bricks and mortar too it seemed to me from the noise and shocks but we came out safe thank god and i had not a scratch though i noticed my monster's hair and beard were on fire and his face was cut and bleeding i can't think how he carried me so safely ah the firemen have a knack of doing that sort of thing said i speaking to mrs mctougall but looking at lily blythe so i have heard the brave noble men said lily speaking to mrs mctougall but looking at me i know not what we conversed about during the remainder of that hour whether i talked sense or nonsense i cannot tell the only thing I'm quite sure of is that I talked incessantly, enthusiastically, to Mrs. McTougall, but kept my eyes fixed on Lily Blythe all the time. And I know that Lily blushed a good deal and bent her pretty head frequently over her darling Pompey and fondled him to his heart's content. That night, my leg violently resented the treatment it had received. When I slept, I dreamed that I was on the rack and that miss blythe strange to say was the chief tormentor while dumps quietly looked on and laughed yes deliberately laughed at my sufferings end of chapter eight nine of my doggy and i by robert ballantyne this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by allison hester Chapter 9 On the Scent But Puzzled It was a considerable time after the fire before my leg permitted me to resume my studies and my duties among the poor. Meanwhile, I had become a regularly established inmate of Mr. Dobson's house and was half jocularly styled Dr. McTougall's assistant. I confess that I had some hesitation at first in accepting such generous hospitality. But, feeling that I could not help myself till my legs should recover, I became reconciled to it. Then, as time advanced, the doctor, who was an experimental chemist, as well as a jack-of-all-trades, found me so useful to him in his laboratory that I felt I was really earning my board and lodging. Meanwhile, Lily Blythe had been sent to visit an aunt of Dr. McDougall's in Kent for the benefit of her health this was well i felt it to be so i knew that her presence would have a disturbing influence on my studies which were by that time nearly completed i felt also that it was madness in me to fall in love with a girl whom i could not hope to marry for years even if she were willing to have me at all which i very much doubted i therefore resolved to put the subject away from me and devote myself heartily to my profession in the spirit of all that word which tells us that whatsoever our hands find to do we should do it with all our might success attended my efforts i passed all my examinations with credit and became not only a fixture in the doctor's family but as he earnestly assured me a very great help to him of course, I did not mention the state of my feelings toward Lily Blythe to anyone, not being in the habit of having confidants, except, indeed, to Dumps. 
In the snug little room just over the front door, which had been given to me as a study, I was wont to pour out many of my secret thoughts to my doggie as he sat before me with cocked ears and demonstrative tail. "'You've been the making of me, Dumps,' said I one evening, not long after I had reached the first round of the ladder of my profession. "'It was you who introduced me to Lily Blythe, and through her to Dr. McDougall, and you may be sure I shall never forget that. Nay, you must not be too demonstrative. When your mistress left you under my care, she said, half jocularly, no doubt, that I was not to steal your heart from her. Wasn't that absurd, eh? As if any heart could be stolen from her. Of course, I cannot regain your heart, Dumps, and I will not even attempt it. Honor bright, as Robin Slider says. By the way, that reminds me that I promised to go down and see old Mrs. Willis this very night, so I'll leave you to the tender mercies of the little McTougals. As I walked down the strand, my last remark to Dumps recurred to me, and I could not help smiling as I thought of the tender mercies to which I had referred. The reader already knows that the juvenile McTougals were somewhat bloodthirsty in their notions of play. When Dumps was introduced to their nursery, by that time transferred from Dobson's dining room to an upper floor, they at once adopted him with open arms. Dumps seemed to be willing, and fortunately turned out to be a dog of exceptionally good nature. He was also tough. No amount of squeezing, bruising, pulling of the ears or tail, falling upon him, either accidentally or on purpose, could induce him to bite. He did, indeed, yell hideously at times, when much hurt, and he snarled, barked, yelped, growled, and showed his teeth continually, but it was all in play, for he was dearly fond of romps. Fortunately, the tall nurse had been born without nerves, she was wont to sit serene in a corner, darning innumerable socks, while a tornado was going on around her. Dumps became a sort of continual sacrifice. On all occasions when a criminal was to be decapitated, a burglar hanged, or a martyr burned, Dumps was the victim, and many a time he was rescued from impending and real death by the watchful nurse, who was too well aware of the innocent ignorance of her ferocious charges to leave dumps entirely to their tender mercies on reaching mrs willis's little dwelling i found young slider officiating at the tea-table i could not resist watching him a moment through a crack in the door before entering now then said he here you are set to work old sneezer with a will the boy had got into a facetious way of calling Mrs. Willis by any term of endearment that suggested itself at the moment, which would have been highly improper and disrespectful if it had not been the outflow of pure affection. The crack in the door was not large enough to permit of my seeing Mrs. Willis herself as she sat in her accustomed window with the spout and chimney pot view. I could only see the withered old hand held tremblingly out for the smoking cup of tea, which the boy handed to her with a benignant smile, and I could hear the soft voice say, "'Thank you, Robin, dear boy, so like.' "'I tell you what it is, Granny,' returned Slider with a frown. "'I'll give you up and you over to the police if you go on comparing me to other people in that way. Now then, have some muffins. They're all hot and soaked in butter. Oh, gummy, just the very thing for your teeth. Fire away now. What's the use of me and Dr. McTougall fetching you nice things if you won't eat them? But I will eat them, Robin, thankfully. "'That ain't the way, old woman,' returned the boy, helping himself largely to the veins which he so freely dispensed. "'It's not thankfully, but heartily you ought to eat em. "'Both, Robin, both. "'Not at all, Granny. "'We asked a blessing fuss, now, didn't we? "'Vell, then, what we've got to do next is go in and win heartily. "'Arter that is time enough to be thankful.' "'What a boy it is!' responded Mrs. Willis. 
I saw the withered old hand disappear with a muffin in it in the direction of the old mouth, and at this point I entered. "'The very man I wanted to see!' exclaimed Slider, jumping up with what I thought was unusual animation, even for him. "'Come along, doctor, just in time for grub. Miss W. hain't eat up all the muffins yet. Fresh cup and saucer, clean plate, ditto knife.' no need for a fork. Now then, sit down. Accepting this hearty invitation, I was soon busy with a muffin, while Mrs. Willis gave a slow, elaborate, and graphic account of the sayings and doings of Master Slider, which account, I need hardly say, was much in his favor, and I am bound to add that he listened to it with pleased solemnity. Now then, old flatterer, when you've quite done, perhaps you'll tell the doctor that I want a weeks of leave of absence, and then perhaps you'll listen to what him and me's got to say on that point. Just keep a stuffin' yourself with muffins, and don't speak. The old lady nodded pleasantly and began to eat with apparently renewed appetite, while I turned in some surprise. A week's leave of absence, said I. "'Just so. A week's leave of absence. Furlough, if you prefers to call it. The truth is, I want a holiday very bad. Granny says so, and I think she's right. Do you think my constitution's made of brass or cast iron or bell metal that I should be able to york on and on for ever, black, black, black and boots and shoes without a holiday?' Why, lawyers, merchants, bankers, even doctors, needs a holiday now and then. How much more shoe blacks? Well, said I with a laugh, there's no reason why shoe blacks should not require and desire a holiday as much as other people. Only it's unusual, because they cannot afford it, I suppose. Ah, that's just where the shoe pinches. As an old gentleman shouted to me the other day with a whack of his umbrella when I scrubbed his corns too hard. Right you are, old stumps, says I, but you'll have to pay tuppence farden hextra for that there whack. Or be took up for assault and battery. Do you know that gentleman larfed? He did, like a hyena, and paid the tuppence down like a man. I let him off the farden in consideration that he ain't got one, and I had no change. Well, to return to the point, which was what the old topper remarked to his wife every night. I've been saving up of late. Saving up, have you? Yes, them penny banks has done it. Why, it ain't a virtue to be saving nowadays, or good, or that sort of thing. What between city missionaries and Sunday schools and penny banks and cheap whittles and grannies like this here old sneezer, it's hardly possible for a young feller to go wrong, even if he was to try. Yes, I've been and saved enough to give me a week's holiday, so I'm going and have my holiday in the north. My elf requires it. Saying this, Young Slider began to eat another muffin with a degree of zest that seemed to give the lie direct to his assertion, so that I could not refrain from observing that he did not seem to be particularly ill. "'Ain't I, though?' he remarked, elongating his round, rosy face as much as possible. "'That's cause you judge too much by appearances. It ain't my body that's wrong. It's my spirit. That's what's the matter with me.' If you only saw the inside of my mind, you'd be astonished. I thoroughly believe you, said I, laughing. And do you really advise him to go, Granny? Yes, my dear, I do, replied Mrs. Willis in her sweet, though feeble tones. You've no idea how he's been slaving and working about me. I have strongly advised him to go, and, you know, good Mrs. Jones will take his place. She's as kind to me as a daughter. The mention of the word daughter set the poor creature meditating on her great loss. She sighed deeply and turned her poor old eyes on me with a yearning, inquiring look. 
I was accustomed to the look by this time, and having no good news to give her, had latterly got into a way of taking no notice of it. That night, however, my heart felt so sore for her that I could not refrain from speaking. "'Ah, dear Granny,' said I, laying my hand gently on her wrist, "'would that I had any news to give you, but I have none, at least not at present. But you must not despair. I have failed up to this time. It's true, although my inquiries have been frequent and carefully conducted.' But, you know, such a search takes a long time, and, and London is a large place. The unfinished muffin dropped from the old woman's hand, and she turned with a deep sigh to the window, where the blank prospect was a not inapt reflection of her own blank despair. Never more, she said, never more. Hope thou in God, for thou shalt yet praise him, who is the health of thy countenance, and thy God, was all that I could say in reply. Then I turned to the boy, who sat with his eyes cast down, as if in deep thought, and engaged him in conversation on other subjects, by way of diverting the old woman's mind from the painful theme. When I rose to go, Slider said he would call Mrs. Jones to mount guard, and give me a convoy home. No sooner were we in the street than he seized my hand, and, in a voice of unusual earnestness, said, "'I've got on her tracks.' "'Whose tracks? What do you mean?' "'On Edie's, to be sure. Edie Willis.' Talking eagerly and fast as we walked along, little Slider told me how he had first been put on the scent by his old friend and fellow waif, the slogger. That juvenile burglar, chancing to meet with Slider, entertained him with a relation of some of his adventures. Among others, he mentioned having, many months before, been out one afternoon with a certain Mr. Brassy, rambling about the streets with an eye to any chance business that might turn up, when they observed a young and very pretty girl looking in at various shop windows. She was obviously a lady, but her dress showed that she was very poor. Her manner and color seemed to imply that she was fresh from the country. The two thieves at once resolved to fleece her. Brassy advised the slogger to come to the soft dodge over her and entice her, if possible, into a neighboring court. The slogger, agreeing, immediately ran and placed himself on a doorstep, which the girl was about to pass. Then he covered his face with his hands and began to groan dismally while Mr. Brassy, with native politeness, retired from the scene. The girl, having an unsuspicious nature and a tender heart, believed the tale of woe which the boy unfolded, and went with him to see his poor mother, who had just fallen down in a fit, and was dying at that moment for want of someone to attend to her. She suggested, indeed, that the slogger should run to the nearest chemist, but the slogger said it would be of no use and might be too late. Would she just run round and see her? The girl acted on the spur of the moment. In her exuberant sympathy, she hurried down an alley, round a corner, under an archway, and walked straight into the lion's den. There Mr. Brassy, the lion, promptly introduced himself and requested the loan of her purse and watch. The poor girl at once understood her position and turned to fly, but a powerful hand on her arm prevented her. Then she tried to shriek, but a powerful hand on her mouth prevented that also. Then she fainted. Not wishing to be found in an awkward position, Mr. Brassy and the slogger searched her pockets hastily and, finding nothing therein, retired precipitately from the scene, taking her little dog with them. As they did so, the young girl recovered, sprang wildly up, and rushing back through the court and alley, dashed into the main thoroughfare. The two thieves saw her attempt to cross, saw a cab horse knock her down, saw a crowd rush to the spot, and then saw no more, owing to pressing engagements requiring their immediate presence elsewhere. There, that's what the slogger told me said little slider with flushed cheeks and excited looks 
and I made him give me an exact description of the gal, which was a facsimile of the picture painted of Miss Edie Willis by her own grandmother, as like as two black cats. This is interesting, very interesting, my boy, said I, stopping and looking at the pavement, but I fear that it leaves us no clue with which to prosecute the search. Of course it don't, rejoined Robin, with one of his knowing looks. But do you think I'd go and aggravate myself about the thing if I hadn't more to say than that? Well, what more do you have to say? Just this, that ever since my talk with the slogger, I've been making very particular inquiries at all the chemists and hospitals round about where he said the accident happened, and I've discovered one hospital where I happens to know the porter and I got him to investigate, and he found there was a case of a young gal run over on the very day this happened. She got feverish, he says, and didn't know what she was saying for months, and nobody come to inquire arter her, and when she began to get well, she sent to Whitechapel to inquire for her grandmother, but her grandmother was gone. Nobody knowed where. Then the young gal got wuss, then she got better, and then she left saying she'd go back to her old home in York, for she was sure the old lady must have returned there. So that's the reason why I'm going to recruit my elf in the north, do you see? But before I go, wouldn't it be better that you should make some investigations at the hospital? I heartily agreed to this, and went without delay to the hospital where, however, no new light was thrown on the subject. On the contrary, I found what Slider had neglected to ascertain, that the name of the girl in question was not Edie Willis, but Eva Bright, a circumstance which troubled me much, and inclined me to believe we had got on a false scent. But when I reflected on the other circumstance of the case, I still felt hopeful, the day of Edie's disappearance tallied exactly with the date of the robbing of the girl by Brassy and the slogger. Her personal appearance, too, as described by the slogger, corresponded exactly with the description given of her granddaughter by Mrs. Willis, and, above all, the sending of a messenger from the hospital by the girl to inquire for her grandmother, Mrs. Willis, were proofs too strong to be set aside by the mystery of the name. In these circumstances, I also resolved to take a holiday and join Robin Slider in his trip to York. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of My Doggy and I by Robert Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Chapter 10 A Disappointment, an Accident, and a Perplexing Return But the trip to York produced no fruit. Some of the tradespeople did, indeed, remember old Mrs. Willis and her granddaughter, but had neither seen nor heard of them since they left. They knew very little about them personally, and nothing whatever of their previous history, as they had stayed only a short time in the town, and had been remarkably shy and uncommunicative. The result, it was thought, of their having come down in life. Much disappointed, Slider and I returned to London. "'It is fortunate that we did not tell Granny the object of our trip, so that she will be spared the disappointment that we have met with said I, as the train neared the metropolis. My companion made no reply. He had evidently taken the matter much to heart. We were passing rapidly through the gradually thickening groups of streets and houses which besprinkle the circumference of the great city, and sat gazing contemplatively on backyards, chimney cans, unfinished suburban residences, pieces of waste ground, back windows, internal domestic arrangements, etc., as they flew past in rapid succession. Robin, said I, breaking the silence again, and using the name, which had by that time grown familiar, have you made up your mind yet about taking service with Dr. McTougall? 
now that we have got mrs jones engaged and paid to look after granny she will be able to get on pretty well without you and you shall have time to run over and see her frequently hmm i don't quite see my way returned the boy with a solemn look you see sir if it was a page in buttons i was to be to attend on my young lady the governess i might take it into consideration but to go into buttons and blue merely to open a door and do the prolite to visitors and mix up things with bad smells by way of a change why do you see the prospect ain't tempting besides i hate blue the buttons is all well enough but blue reminds me so of the bobbies that i didn't think i could survive it long indeed i don't robin said i reproachfully i'm grieved at your indifference to friendship how so sir have you not mentioned merely your objections and the disadvantages without once weighing against them the advantages which is which are said i being under the same roof with me and with punch to say nothing of your young lady ah to be sure well but i did think of all that only don't you see i'll come to be under the same roof with you all in course of time when you've got spliced and set up for slider said i sternly and losing my patience under the boy's presumption you must never again dare to speak of such a thing you know very well that it is quite out of the question and and you'll get into a careless way of referring to such a possibility among servants or no honor bright exclaimed slider with for the first time a somewhat abashed look in his face i wouldn't for the wealth of the injies say a word to nobody whatsomever it's only atween ourselves that i winners to well well enough said i don't in future venture to do it even between ourselves if you care to retain my friendship now robin i added as the train slowed of course you'll not let a hint of our reason for going north pass your lips to poor granny or any one and give her the old message that i'll be along to see her soon it was a pleasant return to such a hearty reception as i met with from the doctor's family although my absence had been but for a few days the children came crowding and clinging around me declaring that it seemed like weeks since i left them the doctor himself was as usual exuberant and his wife extremely kind miss blythe i found had not yet returned and was not expected for some time but the reception accorded me by the doctor and his family was as nothing to the wild welcome lavished upon me by dumps that loving creature came more nearly to the bursting point than i had ever seen him before his spirit was obviously much too large for his body he was romping with the mctougall baby when i entered the instant he heard my voice in the hall he uttered a squeal almost a yell of delight and came down the two flights of stairs in a wriggling heap his legs taking comparatively little part in the movement his paws when first applied to the wax cloth of the nursery floor slipped as if on ice without communicating motion on the stairs his ears tail head hair heart and tongue conspired to convulse him only when he had fairly reached me did the hind legs do their duty as he bounced and wriggled high into the air powers of description are futile vision alone is of any avail in such a case her dog's mortal is such overflowing wealth of affection extinguished at death pshaw thought i the man who thinks so shows that he is utterly void of the merest rudiments of common sense i did not mention the object of my visit to york to the doctor or his wife indeed that natural shyness and reticence which i have found it impossible to shake off except when writing to you good reader 
would in any case have prevented my communicating much of my private affairs to them but particularly in a case like this which seemed to be assuming the aspect of a wildly romantic hunt after a lost young girl more like the plot of a sensational novel than an occurrence in everyday life it may be remarked here that the doctor had indeed understood from mrs willis that she had somehow lost a granddaughter but being rather fussy in his desires and efforts to comfort people in distress he had failed to rouse the sympathy which would have drawn out details from the old woman i therefore merely gave him to understand that the business which had called me to the north of england had been unsuccessful and then changed the subject meanwhile dumps returned to the nursery to resume the game of romps which i had interrupted after a general scrimmage in which the five chips of the elder mctougall had joined without regard to any concerted plan dolly suddenly shouted top what are we to stop for demanded harry whose powers of self-restraint were not strong what a west said dolly sitting down on a stool with a resolute plump rest quick then and let's go on again said harry throwing himself into a small chair while job and jenny sprawled on an ottoman in the window seeing that her troops appeared to be exhausted and that a period of repose had set in the tall nurse thought this a fitting opportunity to retire for a short recreative talk with the servants in the kitchen now be good chillin she said passing out and don't hurt poor little dumps oh no chorused the five while with faces of intense and real solemnity they assured nurse that they would not hurt dumps for the world we'll be so good remarked dolly as the door closed and she really meant it what'll we do to him now asked harry whose patience was exhausted cut off him's head cried dolly clapping her fat little hands no burn him for a witch said jenny oh no we'll skis him flat till he's busted suggested job but jenny thought that would be too cruel and harry said it would be too tame it must not be supposed that these and several other appalling tortures were meant to really be attempted as job afterwards said it was only play oh i'll tell you what we'll do said jack who was considerably in advance of the others in regard to education we'll turn him into joan of arc what's joan of arc asked job it isn't a what it's a who cried jack laughing is it like noah's ark inquired dolly no no it's a lady who lived in france and thought she was sent to deliver her country from from i don't know all what and put on men's clothes and armor and went out to battle and was burnt burnt shouted dolly with sparkling eyes oh what fun we're going to burn you pompey they called him by lily blythe's name dumps who sat in a confused heap in a corner panting seemed regardless of the fate that awaited him but where shall we find armor said harry i know exclaimed job going to the fireplace and seizing the lid of a saucepan which stood on the hearth near enough to the tall fender to be within reach here is something capital a breastplate just the thing cried jack seizing it and whistling to dumps and here's a first-rate helmet said harry producing a toy drum with the heads out the strong contrast between my doggie's conditions of grigginess and humiliation has already been referred to aware that something unusual was pending he crawled towards jack with every hair trailing in lowly submission poor joan of arc might have had a happier fate if she had been influenced by a similar spirit now sir stand up on your hind legs the already well-trained and obedient creature obeyed there he said tying the lid to his hairy bosom and there 
he continued, thrusting the drum on his meek head, which it fitted exactly. Now, Madame Joan, come away. The faggots are ready. With Harry's aid, and to the ineffable joy of Jenny, Job, and Dolly, the little dog was carefully bound to the leg of a small table, and bits of broken toys, of which there were heaps, were piled round it for faggots. Don't be cruel, said Dolly tenderly. Oh, no, we won't be cruel, said Jack, who was really anxious to accomplish the whole execution without giving pain to the victim. The better to arrange some of the fastenings, he clambered on the table. Dolly, always anxious to observe what was being done, attempted to do the same. Jenny, trying to prevent her, pulled at her skirts, and among them they pulled the table over on themselves. It fell with a dire crash. Of course, there were cries and shouts from the children, but these were overtopped and quickly silenced by the hideous yellings of dumps. Full many a time had the poor dog given yelp and yell in that nursery when accidentally hurt, and as often had it wagged its forgiving tail and licked the padding hands of sympathy. But now the yells were loud and continuous, the padding hands were snapped at, and dumps refused to be comforted. His piercing cries reached my study. I sprang upstairs and dashed into the nursery, where the eccentric five were standing in a group, with looks of self-condemning horror in their ten round eyes, and almost equally expressive round mouths. The reason was soon discovered. Poor Dumps had got a hind leg broken. Having ascertained the fact, alleviated the pain as well as I could, and bandaged the limb, I laid my doggie tenderly in the toy bed belonging to Jenny's largest doll, which was quickly and heartily given up for the occasion, the dispossessed doll being callously laid on a shelf in the meantime. It was really quite interesting to observe the effect of this accident on the tender-hearted five. They wept over Dump's most genuine tears. They begged his pardon, implored his forgiveness, in the most earnest tones and touching terms. They took turn about in watching by his sick bed. They held lint and lotion with superhuman solemnity while I dressed his wounded limb, and they fed him with the most tender solicitude. In short, they came out quite in a new and sympathetic light, and soon began to play at sick nursing with each other. This involved a good deal of pretended sickness, and for a long time after that, it was no uncommon thing for visitors to the nursery to find three of the five down with measles, whooping cough, or fever, while the fourth acted doctor and the fifth nurse. The event, however, gave them a lesson in gentleness to dumb animals, which they never afterwards forgot, and which some of my boy readers would do well to remember. With a laudable effort to improve the occasion, Mrs. McTougall carefully printed in huge letters and elaborately illuminated the sentence, Be kind to doggy, and hung it up in the nursery. Thereupon, cardboard, pencils, paints, and scissors were in immediate demand, and soon after, there appeared on the walls in hideously bad but highly ornamental letters the words, Be kind to Caddy. This was followed by, Be kind to Polly, which instantly suggested, Be kind to Dolly. And so, by one means or another, the lesson of kindness was driven home. Soon after this event, Dr. McTougall moved into a new house in the same street. I became regularly established as his partner, and Robin Slider entered on his duties as page in buttons. It is right to observe here that in deference to his prejudices, the material of his garments was not blue, but dark gray. It was distinctly arranged, however, that Robin was to go home, as he called it, to be with Mrs. Willis at nights. On no other condition would he agree to enter the doctor's service, and I found, on talking over the subject with Mrs. Willis herself, that she had become so fond of the boy that it would have been sheer cruelty to part them. In short, it was a case of mutual love at first sight. No two individuals seemed more unlikely to draw together than the meek, gentle old lady and the dashing, harem scarum boy. Yet so it was. "'My dear,' 
she always spoke to me now as if i had been her son this waif as people would call him has clearly been sent to me as a comfort in the midst of all but overwhelming sorrow and i believe too that i have been sent to draw the dear boy to jesus you should hear what long and pleasant talks we have about him and the bible and the better land sometimes indeed i am glad to hear you say so granny and also surprised because although i believe the boy to be well disposed i have seldom been able to get him to open his lips to me on religious subjects ah but he opens his lips to me doctor and reads to me many a long chapter out of the blessed word reads can he read ay can he not so badly considering that i only began to teach him two or three months ago but he knew his letters when we began and could spell out a few words he's very quick you see and a dear boy soon afterwards we made this arrangement with robin more convenient for all parties by bringing mrs willis over to a better lodging in one of the small back streets not far from the doctor's new residence i now began to devote much of my time to the study of chemistry not only because it suited dr mctougall that i should do so but because i had conceived a great liking for that science and entertained some thoughts of devoting myself to it almost exclusively in the various experiments connected therewith i was most ably and i may add delightedly assisted by robin slider i was also greatly amused by and induced to philosophize not a little on the peculiar cast of the boy's mind the pleasure obviously afforded to him by the uncertainty as to results and experiments was very great the probability of a miscarriage created in him intense interest i will not say hope the ignorance of what was coming kept him in a constant flutter of subdued excitement and the astounding results even sometimes to myself of some of my combinations kept him in a perpetual simmer of expectation but after long observation i have come to the deliberate conclusion that nothing whatever gave robin such ineffable joy as an explosion a crash a burst a general reduction of anything to instantaneous and elemental ruin was so dear to him that i verily believe he would have taken his chance and stood by if i had proposed to blow the roof off dr mctougall's mansion nay i almost think that if that remarkable waif had been set on a bombshell and blown to atoms he would have retired from this life in a state of supreme satisfaction while my mind was thus agreeably concentrated on the pursuit of science it received a rude but pleasing yet particularly distracting shock by the return of lily blythe the extent to which this governess was worshipped by the whole household was wonderful almost idolatrous need i say that i joined in the worship and that dumps and robin followed suit i think not and yet there was something strange something peculiar something unaccountable about miss blythe's manner which i could by no means understand End of chapter ten